Do you know which general aviation aircraft are most likely to have fuel-related accidents? And did you know that the odds are good that you've flown one of these aircraft? Stick around to hear about some recent fuel-related accidents and about something that you can do to help prevent them. Hello and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk general aviation. My name is Max Trescott. I've been flying for 50 years. I'm the author of several books and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. And my mission is to help you become the safest possible pilot. Last week, we talked about two Challenger jet crashes involving dual engine failures, one in Naples, Florida, and another in Nebraska in 1994. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 317. And if you're new to this show and you're listening to us on your phone, take a moment right now and touch either the subscribe key, or if you're using the Apple Podcast app, the follow key, so that next week's episode is downloaded for free. And let me mention that this is a listener-supported show, supported by the patronage of people like you. And I'll tell you more about that during our updates. Coming up in the news for the week of March 4th, 2024, a landing United 737 went into the grass at Houston on Friday, and we'll tell you why. Two engine failures occurred this week, one in Nashville and the other in Bellevue, Washington, and they had very different outcomes. One major airline is scaling back pilot hiring in 2024. And we'll tell you about a novel way to extend the range of electric aircraft. All this and more, and the news starts now. From NBCNews.com, United Airlines flight rolled off the runway at a Houston airport Friday morning. The Boeing 737 had landed at the George Bush Intercontinental Airport around 8 a.m. when it rolled into the grass as it exited the runway for the gate. The flight, which left from Memphis International, had 160 passengers and six crew members on board. Passengers deplaned on the taxiway and were bused to the terminal. No one was injured. And after the news, I'll play the ATC audio of the pilot in the tower as they were talking just before the incident. I've also looked at the ADSB data for the landing, and it shows that the aircraft landed long in the second half of the 10,000-foot runway, and it was still doing about 30 knots as it turned right at the last taxiway at the end of the runway. Unfortunately, that turn came just a little late, and one wheel went into the grass, and that landing gear collapsed. And here's the first of our two engine failure stories. This comes from avweb.com. Five Canadians were killed in the crash of a Piper Turbo Lance next to a freeway in Nashville on Monday. Five on board died when the plane crashed and caught fire next to I-80. The aircraft had been cleared for an emergency landing at the airport, but the pilot told ATC he wouldn't make the runway, saying, quote, I'm going to be landing. I don't know where. The pilot reported engine problems, and the controller immediately cleared him for a straight-in approach to runway two at the airport. But the pilot said he had the runway in sight, saying, I'm too far away. I won't make it. The aircraft took off from southern Ontario earlier in the day and made stops in Erie, Pennsylvania, and Mount Sterling, Texas. It left Mount Sterling about 6.19 p.m. Eastern and crashed about two and a half hours later. And one of the comments I read online regarding this crash said if you have a complete power failure and if you have completed the engine failure checklist and if you think the power isn't coming back then pitch and trim for best glide and here's the most important part pull the prop control back to the low rpm position you will actually feel the aircraft accelerating from the reduced drag and gain at least 10 percent in glide distance and the second engine failure had a very different outcome this comes from kiro7.com a small plane equipped with a parachute came down in the Newport Hills neighborhood in Bellevue, Washington on Tuesday. Officials said the plane left the Renton Airport on a training flight at around 5 p.m. and then went down after its engine failed minutes later. The parachute on the Cirrus SR-22 deployed and the plane ended up in a wooded area near a walking path. The pilot and a passenger, both men, were checked out by medics from the Bellevue Fire Department and were found to be unhurt. From avweb.com, Southwest Airlines announced its plans to suspend pilot hiring for the majority of 2024. According to the memo, the airline plans to pause all new hire classes this year, stating, quote, based on expected capacity growth beyond 2024, we've made the difficult decision to suspend initial first officer training classes through the remainder of 2024 and defer job offers beginning with our April classes. Further, Southwest said it would transfer pilots with conditional job offers to a deferred candidate pool that will be tapped into once hiring resumes. However, the airline did not give a time frame for when that could restart. Pilot hiring figures from FAPA.Aero show Southwest hired nearly 2,000 pilots in 2023, a far cry from the projected 345 pilots it plans to hire this year. 
Other airlines, including Spirit, FedEx, and UPS, have also scaled back hiring in recent months, suggesting a slowdown in recruitment following an unprecedented surge in hiring in the aftermath of the pandemic. From GlobalAir.com, Pipistrol Velis Electro achieves LSA airworthiness exemption from the FAA. Pipistrol announced on Monday that the FAA granted a light sport aircraft airworthiness exemption for the Pipistrol Velis Electro. The certification opens up flight training in electric aircraft within the U.S. With this FAA exemption, U.S. flight schools can use electric aircraft within flight training programs. The Velis Electro offers a low-cost and sustainable learning platform for student pilots. With the LSA exemption, student pilots can learn flying skills and transition from zero-flight experience to flying solo while gaining hands-on experience on a next-gen power system. Pipistrol President and Managing Director Gabriel Massey said, taking off for the first time is exhilarating and even more so in an electric aircraft. We're looking forward to seeing more pilots take to the skies and experience their first flight in the Velis Electro. Also from GlobalAir.com, NTSB no longer blames Tamarack system and rewrites a 2018 citation crash report. The NTSB has reversed its findings over deadly 2018 citation CJ2 crash, granting winglet maker Tamarack's petition and stating that the available evidence does not sufficiently conclude that their Atlas system caused the crash. The NTSB updated its docket for the November 30th, 2018 crash in Memphis, Indiana that killed three people, and they've now included a response to Tamarack's petition for reconsideration. The citation was fitted with winglet modifications by Tamarack consisting of aluminum wing extension, composite winglets, and a proprietary load alleviation system known as the Active Technology Load Alleviation System, or ATLAS. The initial final report noted six pins in the modified wingtip extensions were curled and two pins were not aligned, which could have led to power disruption and triggered the rollout. But the report concluded that investigators could not determine when the pins had been bent. The NTSB report found that an electrical failure in the system likely caused one of the control surfaces to deploy separately, which caused an uncommanded roll. Nearly six months after the crash, The FAA grounded all Cessna planes equipped with Atlas winglets, which lifted in the summer of 2019 after Tamarack found a fix to improve the safety and reliability. After the report, Tamarack set a petition to the NTSB to reconsider its findings, claiming they were inconsistent with the degree and timing of the tax deflection and the evidence described, which could be linked with the force of impact, not necessarily indicating the position in flight. In a rare occurrence, the NTSB granted the petition. The response notes that Tamarack said the NTSB's final report contained key erroneous findings and factual errors, and that the cumulative effect of the errors is to clearly demonstrate that there is no evidence that Tamarack's atlas was in any way responsible for the November 30th, 2018 accident. The initial final report said the probable cause was the asymmetric deployment of the left wing load alleviation system for undetermined reasons. This has been altered to read, quote, the pilot's inability to regain airplane control after a left roll that began for reasons that could not be determined based on the available evidence. From the scottishsun.co.uk, a Delta Airlines pilot who was caught with alcohol in his system before he was due to fly a Boeing 767 from Scotland to New York has been jailed. The 63-year-old captain, who was due to take control of the large aircraft, when he was caught with an open bottle of Jägermeister in his luggage when it was searched by security staff last June. Edinburgh Sheriff Court was told one of the bottles was found to be half full, and the police were subsequently contacted and the pilot arrested following a failed breath test. The pilot was remanded in custody court this week after he pleaded guilty to reporting for duty as a pilot while being impaired through drink or drugs at Edinburgh Airport last year. Prosecutor Matthew Miller told the court the pilot was due to captain a 767 to JFK when his luggage was selected for inspection. The pilot provided police with a sample of his breath around 9.30 a.m., and he was subsequently arrested. Later, he provided a blood sample, which had more than double the legal limit of alcohol in his blood. Lawyer Pamela Rogers, defending, provided the court with a medical report of the treatment the pilot has been receiving for his alcoholism and said he is under no allusion to the seriousness of the offense. And in other news, from AviationWeek.com, Schweitzer has been restarting its production line since 2018, and as of February 2024, has delivered 12 new-built S-300 helicopters 
and several refurbished aircraft since 2021. In November 2023, Schweitzer announced that it had completed its first OEM certified helicopters program, which involves accepting used helicopters for inspection, repairs, and replacement. The company also offers overhauls of main and tail rotor gearboxes and landing gear. And last week was not a good week for Cirrus SR-20 landing accidents. Two of them had landing accidents. One was at Sanford, Florida. That aircraft landed short of the runway. And the other one involved a touch-and-go off the left side of the runway. That had been a recent sale, and the pilot was reported to have had just four hours of experience in the aircraft prior to the incident. And finally, from FlyingMag.com, Ampere, a developer of hybrid electric propulsion systems and manufacturer of the Eco Caravan, a nine-seat modified Cessna 208B Grand Caravan, believes it now holds the key to extending the range of electric and hybrid electric aircraft. The company on Monday announced its acquisition of electric aviation technology developer Magpie Aviation, including the company's aero towing solution for an undisclosed fee. Magpie Aero Towing uses electrified tow aircraft to stretch out the flight time of larger electric models. According to Magpie, electric aircraft are often limited to short routes due to battery energy density constraints. The company is developing technology to counteract this, specifically a network of electric tow aircraft that could enable zero emission flights of EVTOL aircraft and other electric aircraft beyond a thousand statute miles. Here's how it works. An electrified main aircraft takes off and climbs to its cruising altitude while a tow aircraft departs from a charging station at a nearby secondary airport. The pair meet autonomously in the sky and are connected at a safe distance. The tow aircraft then begins towing while the main aircraft idles and can be swapped out en route to enable even longer flights. Last year, Magpie demonstrated what claimed were the world's first automated towing connections between two flying aircraft. Its autonomous active hook system tracked, positioned, and connected two aircraft in repeated test with centimeter-level precision, according to the company. Magpie said aero towing becomes cost-competitive at scale despite the involvement of extra aircraft. Airlines would be able to operate large electric aircraft over longer distances, which the firm said could help them save on fuel and maintenance costs. Those savings may also offset the added cost of towing, which Magpie said is kept economical by operating simple aircraft out of secondary airports. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up next, a few of my updates. And later, we'll talk about some recent fuel-related accidents and what you can do to help prevent them. All right here on the Aviation News Talk Podcast. Now let's get to the good news. First, congratulations to Daryl Contreras. He writes, I passed my CFII checkride a couple of weeks ago. Once again, your show was invaluable in my preparation, especially the episode with Jason Blair on the CFII exam. I always get so much out of Aviation News Talk. He says, in preparation for my checkride, I prepared what I now call my instrument airplane oral exam guide. In the intro, I recommend your podcast as a valuable resource. And if you read through, you'll see that I also mentioned the a couple of other examples of episodes to listen to on page 75 and page 84. And I took a look at the guide. It runs over 100 pages long, so he's done a great job of putting that together. So, Daryl, again, congratulations to you. Now let's talk about United Flight 2477 and its runway excursion that occurred at Houston on Friday morning. Now, I'm used to seeing a number of business jet runway excursions each year, typically following unstable approaches, when a jet lands long and is unable to stop before the end of the runway. But those kinds of incidents are relatively rare for U.S. airlines, so this one was a bit of a surprise to me. The United 737 took off from Memphis and landed at KIAH, the George Bush Intercontinental Airport. It landed on runway 27, which is 10,000 feet long and 150 feet wide. That runway has two parallel taxiways, taxiway Sierra Alpha and Sierra Bravo, both located on the north side of the runway. By rolling to the end of the runway, you're at the closest point to access the airline terminals, which begin near the end of the runway and north of the two parallel taxiways. And I'm guessing it's not unusual for a pilot to ask to roll out to the end of the runway to save perhaps a minute or two of taxi time. There are multiple high-speed taxiways available from the runway. After passing the halfway point of the runway, you come to high-speed taxiway Sierra Golf, and then later high-speed taxiway Sierra Foxtrot. 
after these two high speeds at the very end of the runway is a 90 degree right turn on a taxiway Sierra Charlie, which leads directly to terminals C and E. And by the way, the flight aware says that this aircraft was headed to gate C40. Now take a listen to this conversation between the pilot and the tower, courtesy of liveatc.net, and see what you think the pilot's motivation may have been. You know, 2477 Houston Tower, good morning, winds 1807, runway 27, Cleveland. Tower, United 2477. United 2477 Tower. How's our spacing looking? Can we roll it all the way to the end? Uh, keep your speed up, that's proof. Okay, United 2477, we'll do. United 2477, right at Sierra Charlie, contact the ramp, good day. Sierra Charlie, we're at United 2477, great weekend. At 2477, uh, correction to United 1383, go around. At 1383, we're going around runway uh, 27. At 2477, I see in the grass rolling the uh, trucks en route. At 2477. Tower United 2477. At 2477, Tower. Are you guys seeing anything in the aft section, anything that would indicate uh, something uh, is wrong back there? You know, 2477, did you copy that? Uh, they, they requested you shut down the uh, engine on the left side. You know, 2477? You know, 2477, we got it. And Tower United said 2477, top of the operation, keep off the vehicle. Yep, United 2477, if you can change to 135.625, they're all on the emergency frequency ready for you. To me, it sounds like the pilot was aware that there was another aircraft space closely behind him. So in order to roll out to the end of the runway and not force the aircraft behind him to go around, he'd have to do a high-speed taxi down the runway. Ironically, the pilot's apparent effort to save a minute of taxi time did force the pilot of the aircraft behind to go around and apparently led to the landing gear collapse. Here's what I can see from looking at Flight Radar 24 data for this aircraft. Rather than landing in the normal touchdown zone and doing a high-speed taxi, the pilot appears to have landed very long and then was a little too fast to make the turnoff at the end of the runway. According to the data, as the pilot was just reaching the runway threshold, it says he was 350 feet above the runway. Now that is very high as a typical runway threshold crossing height would be more like 50 feet. This tells us he was probably aiming at a point far beyond that normal aiming point that's a thousand feet beyond the runway threshold. As the aircraft reached the halfway point or about 5,000 feet down the runway, the aircraft was still apparently 250 feet above the runway at 128 knots. Somewhere between the 7,000-foot point and the 8,500-foot point, the aircraft appears to have touched down. At the 8,500-foot point, it had just passed the last high-speed exit and was still doing 78 knots ground speed. At around the 9,500-foot point, it was still doing 58 knots and had just 500 feet left before the last exit, taxiway Sierra Charlie. As the aircraft began the right turn onto Sierra Charlie, it was still at 30 knots. The aircraft almost made the turn, but overshot the turn slightly with the right wheel on the taxiway and the left wheel running off into the grass on the left side of the taxiway. The left landing gear collapsed on the plane. That almost certainly occurred after the left wheels went into the grass, because if the left gear had collapsed before the aircraft went into the grass, we would have expected the airplane to have turned to the left and not to the right. Obviously, it's early, less than 24 hours after the incident occurred, and there's not a lot of information publicly available, but that's what the ADSB data seems to show. Regardless of what may have actually happened, it's a good time to note that rushing in aviation rarely saves time. As GA pilots, we want to be careful to do things the right way every time and not succumb to the temptation to rush the process to save a little time. Now, case in point is you've probably heard controllers encouraging landing aircraft to try to exit at a certain taxiway perhaps because there's a landing aircraft behind them. A client of mine, landing at the very short Palo Alto airport, was asked by a controller to get off at taxiway Charlie if able. My client, who's a very nice guy who always tries to help out others, tried a bit too hard to make taxiway Charlie and blew a tire. That, of course, closed the airport's only runway for about 45 minutes until the aircraft could be removed from the runway. So essentially, he let his good judgment be overridden by a suggestion from the controller to try to help out the pilot landing behind him. A far better outcome would have been if he simply said unable and continued on down to the next taxiway. 
Now, one of the best pieces of advice I've heard about this kind of situation is that as pilots, we should never decide ahead of time which taxiway we'll use to exit the runway. Instead, do a normal landing with normal braking, and only after you've slowed to a speed at which you can turn, then, and only then, decide which taxiway to exit on. And if the plane behind you has to go around, whose fault is that? It's certainly not your fault if the plane behind you didn't do a good job of spacing himself out behind you and they had to go around because you're still on the runway. And definitely don't try to change your normal procedures to try to save a minute of taxi time. As the United Incident at Houston seems to show, it's definitely not worth it to use non-standard procedures to save a minute of taxi time. By the way, the flightaware.com website shows that United Flight 2477 arrived 24 minutes early. So you really have to ask, what was the point of trying to save a minute or two of taxi time? Oh, and by the way, I'll post a link in the show notes to the flightradar24.com data for United Flight 2477, so you can take a look at it yourself. And I just want to mention that I had a busy flying week. I had three trips to Southern California this week, which is really unusual. I might go an entire year and do just three trips. Uh, two of those were in the Vision Jet. One was in a Cirrus SR-22 all of them were day trips back and forth. A couple things that were kind of interesting. Uh, we did have a great landing coming into Oakland, which I videotaped. And I posted that a few days ago for people who support the show via Patreon at the $20 a month level. So if you haven't checked that video out already, go ahead and check that out. And a lot of comments from people said they really enjoyed that particular one. And then on Thursday, I was at Van Nuys. And just as we were getting ready to leave, it started raining. In fact, we were getting wet as we were loading the aircraft to come back, and we had a thunderstorm cell just come and sit right on top of the airport. Now, if you're listening to this on an app that supports chapter photos, you can take a look and see what the view looked like from inside the aircraft. You can see the uh, Sirius XM showed a very large uh, cell right on top of us, and it's pretty rainy out the window. We sat there for over an hour with the engine running, waiting for things to clear, Finally, we were able to get out. Very little moved at the airport during that hour. And in fact, the controller said something that really surprised me. He said, this is the worst weather I have ever seen. And in fact, we were parked up next to a runway 16 right down at the other end of the airport. Aircraft that were waiting down by runway 34 left. Those aircraft were hit by hail. So we were really lucky to be at the, the north end of the airport when that occurred. Now, we definitely made the right decision to wait. You know, when you have thunderstorms passing overhead, you just don't know what kind of squirrely winds you're going to get. We could have easily had a microburst go by with a massive downdraft. So it made sense to uh, just sit there and wait. So please do the same thing. If you have bad weather, please wait it out. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, this is a listener-supported show, somewhat akin to the way patrons support artists or creators. Essentially, you, the listener our patron of the arts, supporting this show and other creators that you admire. So if you value the content you're consuming here and want to contribute to its sustainability, I encourage you to become a part of our community and support Aviation News Talk. And now see if you know any of these people who've endowed the show with their patronage during the past week. First, we have a new mega supporter that we'd like to welcome to the show. These are the people that contribute $50 a month, and that's Andre Tikovnov. And we'd also like to welcome back John Tosto as a mega supporter. He's been on hiatus for about six months. So welcome back, John. And thanks to these new people who support the show now via Patreon, Tim KU, George Giles Jr., Carter Olson, and Ron Chesley. We also had a one-time donation via Zelle. Thanks so much to David Chalensky. And a donation via Venmo. Thanks so much to Christopher Raffo. And thanks to everyone who supports the show in whatever way that you do. Coming up next, we're going to be talking about fuel exhaustion and fuel starvation accidents, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Let's talk about fuel-related accidents. Which aircraft are most likely to be involved in these accidents and just how many ways there are to run out of fuel? And well, it turns out that there are a lot of ways. I decided to talk about this today as I recently spent a few hours looking at all of the new NTSB final reports published in the last six weeks. 
And one thing that struck me was the large number of fuel starvation and fuel exhaustion accidents for such a short period of time. I counted 10 of them, which to me seems like a large number for an accident type that's largely avoidable. One thing that struck me was, at least based on the sample, that these accident types are occurring to mostly older aircraft. For example, of the 10 accidents that I found and we'll be talking about, the newest of them was a 1982 Mooney built 42 years ago. And the other nine accidents, well, they were all in even older aircraft. Part of the reason modern aircraft have fewer fuel-related accidents is that they have low fuel warning enunciators and or fuel totalizers, which help pilots to be more aware of their fuel state. And I remember a number of years ago that Cessna announced that there hadn't been a single fuel exhaustion accident since they restarted their piston production in 1997, because all of those newer aircraft had low fuel warning enunciators. So when the fuel reached some minimum level, you'd get an enunciator. And then starting in 2004, when Cessna started shipping the G1000 in their aircraft, that low fuel warning enunciator became a CAS message or crew alerting system message that also had a loud chime to go with it so you couldn't miss it. Plus, all G1000 aircraft have fuel totalizers and fuel range rings, which make it easier to know your fuel status. Now, I'm sure that since that announcement, there have been some fuel-related accidents in these newer Cessnas, but the point is that there are fewer of these accidents in newer aircraft. But if you're flying an older aircraft, like all the ones we'll be talking about today, I'll talk at the end about what you can do to reduce fuel-related accidents in these aircraft. Now, another thing that struck me was that these fuel-related accidents didn't happen to just low-time pilots. A number of these occurred to high-time ATP-rated pilots. Though some of these high-time pilots had very low time in the aircraft make and model. And this is something you find across the board when you look at aircraft accidents of all types. And that is that accident rates are driven less by a pilot's total time than they are by the pilot's time in the make and model of aircraft. And accidents tend to decrease once a pilot has at least 100 hours in a particular make and model of aircraft. So whenever you're transitioning into a new aircraft type, you want to be very careful in the first 100 hours you fly in that new aircraft type, regardless of how much total experience you have. Let's get first to a couple of definitions. First, fuel exhaustion. Fuel exhaustion occurs when there's no usable fuel on board. And the most common cause of fuel exhaustion is poor in-flight decision making, simply running out of fuel. Another cause is leaving the fuel caps off, as this allows fuel to be sucked out by the low pressure area over the wing surface. Fuel exhaustion can be avoided by careful pre-flight planning, a thorough pre-flight inspection, and being aware of how much fuel there is on board at all times. Next definition, fuel starvation. Fuel starvation occurs when there is fuel on board, but it's not getting to the engine. Now, the most common cause of fuel starvation is the pilot selecting the wrong fuel tank or placing the fuel selector in the off position by mistake. Other less common but possible causes include engine-driven fuel pump failure or blocked fuel lines, injectors, or fuel vents. To help avoid fuel starvation, pilots should be familiar with an aircraft systems, and a good place to learn about that is to read Chapter 7 of the AFM for your aircraft. Now let's talk about the 10 fuel-related accidents I found, and these are in no particular order. This first involved the, the newest aircraft, a 1982 Mooney at Lamar, Colorado. It was fuel exhaustion and involved an ATP-rated pilot who was 71 years old. Fortunately, there were no injuries, and he was on a ferry flight moving this airplane across the country. From the NTSB report, it says, aircraft crashed six miles from the airport. The pilot reported that about four hours and 15 minutes after departure, the engine lost all power. The pilot was successful in restoring engine power by switching fuel tanks and turning on the auxiliary fuel pump. However, the engine lost all power again about five miles from the destination runway. The pilot conducted a forced landing to a field during which the airplane struck a fence, resulting in substantial damage to both wings. Post-accident examination of the airplane revealed that the fuel tanks contained no usable fuel. The pilot reported there were no pre-accident mechanical failures or malfunctions with the airplane that would have precluded normal operation. Probable cause, the pilot's inadequate fuel planning and improper in-flight decision making, which resulted in a total loss of engine power due to fuel exhaustion. Now, this pilot had a total of 6,991 hours, but he had only 18 hours total in this make and model aircraft. 
Now, this was a 1982 Mooney. I found pictures of its cockpit when it was last for sale. It showed it had older avionics, one Garmin 430, and there didn't appear to be a fuel totalizer in the plane. Now, this next accident involved a Cessna 182 near North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and involved a private pilot who was 25 years old. Again, no injuries. From the NTSB report, the pilot stated he visually confirmed there were 52 gallons of fuel on board and that both fuel caps were secure to their respective fuel port during his pre-flight inspection of the airplane. The pilot then departed on the approximate 1 hour and 15 minute flight. While en route, the low fuel light flickered on and off. The pilot noted the fuel gauge was reading half full and he continued with the flight. When the airplane was about 8 minutes from the destination and after descending to traffic pattern altitude, the engine stopped producing power. The pilot was unable to restart the engine and made a forced landing to a highway. The airplane impacted a jersey barrier during the landing, which resulted in substantial damage to the airframe. FAA inspectors examined the aircraft accident site and observed that the left wing fuel cap was missing and blue fuel stains were evident on the wing aft of the fuel cap that extended to the trailing edge of the flap. Recovery personnel also reported that both fuel tanks were empty when the wings were removed for transport. The missing fuel cap was not located. Based on this information, it's likely that the pilot did not properly secure the left fuel cap during the pre-flight inspection and that during the flight it separated from the airplane. The remaining fuel was siphoned from the fuel tanks through the open fuel port, resulting in fuel exhaustion and the total loss of engine power. Probable cause, the pilot's failure to properly secure the left wing fuel cap, which resulted in a loss of engine power due to fuel exhaustion. Now, this pilot's total time in all aircraft was just 101 hours. He had a total of only eight hours in this make and model, and in the previous 90 days, he had zero hours of flight. So this pilot had not flown much before he flew, and this was a 1974-182. Now, this next accident involves a Piper Comanche at St. Jacob, Illinois. It involved a 52-year-old pilot who unfortunately died in the crash. From the NTSB report, the aircraft was topped off with fuel on the day of the accident. The airplane was flown to an intermediate airport, then back to the original departure airport. After returning to the departure airport, the pilot and a pilot-rated passenger took off to practice full-stop takeoffs and landings. They performed five uneventful takeoff and landings. During the last takeoff and climb, the airplane sustained a loss of engine power. Witnesses reported that the airplane's right wing dropped, and the plane rotated clockwise as viewed from above before it impacted the ground. Post-accident examination of the aircraft revealed no usable fuel in the wing's fuel bladder tanks. Both fuel bladders were collapsed, and the attachment hardware for the bladder was not properly attached to the wing. Examination of the fuel system revealed that the fuel sending units had bends on their float arms inconsistent with their design and did not meet airplane maintenance manual specifications for resistance values. Additionally, the fuel selector valve did not contain detents for the position of each fuel tank selection. Examination of the engine, engine accessories, and airframe revealed no other mechanical anomalies that would have precluded normal engine operation. The collapsed fuel bladder would have reduced the fuel capacity when the airplane was last serviced with fuel. The fuel sending units likely provided incorrect fuel tank indications on the fuel gauges in the cabin. The pilot likely would have performed fuel calculations based upon the designed fuel tank capacity. Both the diminished fuel bladder capacity due to the collapsed bladders and the improper fuel level indications likely led to the loss of engine power due to fuel exhaustion. And then it goes on to mention some medical conditions of the pilots, though it says those conditions were not a factor in the accident. Probable cause, the inadequate maintenance of the airplane fuel system that resulted in fuel exhaustion and a loss of engine power. The pilot had an estimated 1,310 hours of total time. The pilot rated passenger was an ATP commercial and flight instructor estimated to have 10,000 hours of time. And this was a 1958 Comanche. This next accident involved a Piper Archer at Iola, Kansas. And there is an error in this report. It did say that the pilot, who was 27 years old, had a single-engine seaplane certificate. I found the pilot's name online, looked him up in the FAA database, and he actually has a single-engine land certificate, which I suspected. And there were also minor injuries in this crash. From the NTSB report, the pilot reported that he had 48 gallons of fuel on board and assumed that he would be able to fly for about five hours. After about four hours and 20 minutes of flying, the pilot began his descent for landing at his destination, turned the fuel pump on, and checked the fuel gauges. 
The gauges read about three or four gallons of fuel remaining in each fuel tank. Shortly thereafter, the engine quit. The pilot switched fuel tanks, and the engine started again momentarily, and then quit again. He landed the airplane on a gravel road about 1.5 miles northeast of the airport. After touchdown, the right wing struck a tree and separated from the fuselage, resulting in substantial damage. The pilot reported that he believes the airplane ran out of fuel, which resulted in the loss of engine power. Probable cause? The pilot's inadequate fuel planning, which resulted in a total loss of engine power due to fuel exhaustion. Now, this pilot had 207 hours total in all aircraft. He had 83 hours in the make and model of aircraft, and he had flown six hours in the prior 24 hours. And this was a 1976 Piper Archer. Now, this next accident occurred near Snohomish, Washington. It involved a Piper Cherokee 6 and a 56-year-old pilot. Fortunately, there were no injuries. From the NTSB report, the pilot reported that he had flown about 10 minutes from one airport to another, and after landing, the engine hiccuped like it was losing power and then revved up. The pilot turned the fuel pump off and back on, and the engine seemed to clear up. The pilot performed an uneventful engine run-up and elected to conduct a short field takeoff. As the airplane climbed through about 700 feet MSL, the engine began to surge, followed by a total loss of engine power. The pilot attempted to land on a nearby road. However, he realized he was unable to reach it and instead landed in an open field, which resulted in substantial damage to the engine mount. The pilot reported that before the flight, the owner of the airplane sent him a text message telling him that the fuel selector valve was on the left tip tank. The pilot said he didn't think it was an issue. However, he could not remember if he put the selector valve on the left main fuel tank or not. He added that he could see himself switching the fuel tank position by hand and then putting it back where it was without visually verifying the position. The owner of the airplane reported that he had about two or three gallons of fuel in the left wing tip tank before he added four gallons of fuel before performing a mini run-up and taxiing back to his hangar. The owner estimated that the left tip tank had about four gallons of fuel in it. Post-accident examination of the aircraft revealed that all four fuel tanks were intact and undamaged. The left wing tip tank was void of any fuel, while the left main tank, right main, and right wing tip tank contained a significant amount of fuel. Examination of the airframe and engine revealed no evidence of mechanical malfunction or failures that would have precluded normal operation. And the report says that it's likely that while the pilot conducted his pre-flight, he inadvertently positioned the fuel selector to the left wing tip tank position. Probable cause, the total loss of engine power during takeoff due to fuel starvation, and the pilot's improper fuel tank selection and inadequate pre-flight inspection. And this report doesn't list the pilot's total hours of experience. It does mention that this was the 1973 Piper Cherokee 6. Our next accident occurred near Palm Coast, Florida. It involved a Cessna 195 and a 34-year-old ATP-rated pilot who had minor injuries. From the NTSB report, the pilot stated that before the flight, he performed a normal pre-flight inspection and flight planning. He advised that he did not take on any fuel as he had enough for the intended flight. After boarding the airplane, he started the engine. The start was normal, and all instruments indicated everything was normal. He taxied to runway 24 for takeoff, and while short of the runway, he ran the engine at idle for about five minutes and verified all instruments were normal. Upon entering the runway for takeoff, he performed a complete run-up procedure, and no abnormality was observed. He took off, and upon reaching about 1,000 feet, he configured the plane for cruise. About five miles south of the airport, the engine lost power. The propeller continued to windmill, but produced no power. The pilot attempted to restart the engine without success. The pilot declared an emergency and informed ATC he'd be landing on Interstate 95. While approaching and setting up for landing on I-95, the passenger informed the pilot that he had a semi-trailer truck on his right side, so the pilot tried to maneuver to his left as much as possible. The right wing then contacted the truck, at which point the pilot lost control. The airplane cartwheeled and came to rest inverted off the right side of I-95. According to the passenger, while the pilot performed the pre-flight inspection of the airplane, the passenger chatted with some other pilots in the hangar. He did not see the pilot performing the pre-flight inspection of the airplane. After the pre-flight was complete, the pilot assisted the passenger in boarding the airplane and getting buckled up into the five-point harness. After engine start, the pilot paused for about five minutes to warm up the engine oil and then performed an engine run-up. Everything seemed normal. 
The passenger advised that a lot of pilots would go to the destination airport they'd planned on for lunch and to buy fuel, as it was about 50 cents per gallon cheaper than at the home airport. He believed that the pilot was planning to get fuel there. The passenger also advised that after the accident, the pilot was absolutely confident that he had enough fuel for the 20-minute flight, and the pilot said his fuel totalizer showed 23 gallons. According to the lead recovery specialist, during the wreckage recovery, there was no smell of fuel on scene except for a slight smell of fuel near the engine. Additionally, no fuel was recovered from the airplane. The airplane was equipped with an onboard engine monitor that recorded exhaust gas, cylinder head temperature, and shock cooling rate. The fuel totalizer would have measured with high resolution the amount of fuel that flowed into the engine. Before the flight, though, the pilot would have had to enter into the unit the known quantity of fuel on board, and then it would keep track of all fuel delivered to the engine. Examination of the airplane and engine revealed no pre-impact malfunctions or failures that would have precluded normal operation. Additionally, the fuel strainer and the carburetor float chamber were, were absent of fuel. Probable cause, the pilot's inadequate fuel planning and pre-flight inspection, which resulted in total loss of engine power due to fuel exhaustion. The ATP-rated pilot had a total time of 4,415 hours, and he had 253 hours in this make and model. The passenger held a private and had 2,447 total hours, and this was in a 1949 Cessna 195. The next accident occurred near Great Barrington, Massachusetts, and involved a Piper Tripacer, and there were no injuries to the student pilot or the flight instructor who were on board. From the NTSB report, the student pilot stated that he and a flight instructor departed on a local area instructional flight with about 28 gallons of fuel, enough for three or more hours of flying. With the fuel selector on the left fuel tank, they performed various training maneuvers, then flew to a nearby airport where they switched to the right fuel tank. They performed three full stop landings before returning to the practice area. After about one hour of flight, they entered the traffic pattern on the downwind to base leg and switched the fuel selector back to the left fuel tank before beginning their final approach. On the final leg of the traffic pattern, they elected to perform a go-around and added full power. However, the engine lost all power without warning. Too low to troubleshoot, the instructor took the controls and performed a forced landing in a cornfield which resulted in substantial damage to the airplane. As fuel leaked down from the right tank, the student pilot and CFI evacuated. The student reported that during the egress, he turned off the electrical master switch and switched the fuel tank into the 12 o'clock position. Post-accident examination of the engine did not reveal evidence of any pre-impact mechanical malfunctions or failures that would preclude normal engine operation. The left fuel tank was compromised during impact, and about four gallons of fuel were drained out of the right wing tank by first responders. The student pilot's description that he had manipulated the fuel selector to the 12 o'clock position after the accident and during his egress would be consistent with him attempting to turn off fuel flow in order to mitigate the chances of a post-accident fire. However, the position of the fuel selector handle after the accident was actually the right fuel tank position. Given that the loss of engine power occurred shortly after switching fuel tanks, it's likely that the student pilot inadvertently placed the fuel selector in the off position during the flight, thus eventually starving the engine for fuel during the attempted go-around. The CFI was likely unable to confirm the fuel selection because the selector handle was installed on the sidewall behind the student's left leg. Probable cause? The student pilot's inadvertent movement of the fuel selector to the off position, which resulted in fuel starvation and a total loss of engine power. The next accident occurred near Marshall, Texas, and involved a Cessna 150 and a student pilot. There were no injuries. From the NTSB report, while en route to his home airport, the student pilot reported that the engine RPM momentarily decreased. When the engine RPM decreased a second time, he reported to ATC that he had engine issues. The student pilot applied carb heat and engine power was restored, but shortly thereafter, the engine lost total power. Unable to reach the destination, the student pilot performed a forced landing to a field. During the landing, the airplane collided with trees and a fence, resulting in substantial damage to the left wing and fuselage. Post-accident examination of the airframe revealed both the left and right fuel tanks were empty when checked with a dipstick and no fuel came out when either tank was sumped. About seven ounces of fuel was sumped from the fuel strainer and an additional empty water bottle of fuel was drained from the bottom of the engine after the airplane was recovered. After the accident, the engine started and ran for about 10 minutes before it quit. Fuel range and endurance calculations were performed using ADSB data and the student pilot statements. The student pilot had fully fueled the airplane on the morning of the accident and departed to another airport to meet with the CFI for several flights. 
the total flight time was calculated to be about four hours. The student reported using a full-rich mixture setting during the flight and estimated the airplane consumed about six gallons per hour. The total fuel capacity of the airplane was 26 gallons, of which 22.5 gallons were listed as being usable. The circumstances of the accident are consistent with fuel exhaustion. The fact that the engine started and ran on residual fuel in the fuel system is evidence that there were no mechanical failures or malfunctions that would have prevented normal operation of the engine during flight. Probable cause, the student pilot's inadequate fuel planning and improper in-flight decision-making, which resulted in a total loss of engine power due to fuel exhaustion. Now, for the student pilot, there's no total hours listed. This was a 1965 Cessna 150. The next accident occurred near Sydney, Ohio, and it involved a Beach A36 and a 73-year-old pilot who had no injuries. From the NTSB report, the right seat pilot reported that after performing a pre-flight inspection, he anticipated the airplane would need to be refueled and subsequently left the fuel caps unlocked. After a discussion with the left seat pilot who was acting as PIC, they decided they would not need to refuel before the flight. Both pilots performed another walk-around inspection, and neither pilot noticed the fuel caps remained unlocked. Shortly after takeoff, the right seat pilot noticed that both fuel caps were not secure and that fuel was escaping from both main fuel tanks. He elected to return to the departure airport and land on the opposite direction runway. The pilots were both manipulating the controls when they landed the airplane hard on the main landing gear. The airplane then bounced and veered to the right of the runway, impacting a terminal sign and taxi light. The hard landing and subsequent runway excursion resulted in substantial damage to the wings and fuselage. The pilots reported that there were no pre-accident mechanical malfunctions or failures with the airplane that would have precluded normal operation. Probable cause, the pilot's improper landing flare, which resulted in a hard landing, runway excursion, and subsequent impact with a terminal sign and taxi light. The pilot was a private pilot with a total of 1,341 hours and 360 hours in the make and model of aircraft, and this was a 1980 Beach A36. And finally, our last accident occurred near Forney, Texas. It was a twin-engine Piper Aztec, and it was doing an aerial survey flight with a 50-year-old pilot on board. From the NTSB report, the pilot reported that while returning from a five-hour aerial survey flight, the pilot noticed about a quarter tank of fuel indicated on each fuel gauge and continued the flight toward the destination. While on the approach, the pilot noticed that both engines sputtered and both fuel gauges indicated empty. The pilot conducted a forced landing to a highway median and the airplane impacted guardrails. Both wings, the empennage and fuselage, sustained substantial damage. Post-accident examination of the airplane revealed that the fuel tanks contained no usable fuel. Probable cause, the pilot's inadequate fuel planning and improper in-flight decision-making, which resulted in a total loss of engine power due to fuel exhaustion. And the pilot had a total of 872 hours in all aircraft, just 69 hours in this particular make and model of aircraft, and it was a 1980 Piper Aztec. Now let's talk about what you can do if you fly an older aircraft to reduce the chance of a fuel-related accident. First, if the aircraft doesn't have a fuel totalizer, then I strongly encourage you to have one installed in the aircraft. Fuel totalizers are very different from your fuel gauges, and in some respects they can be more accurate than your fuel gauges. Fuel gauges, like the ones that come with your airplane when it was originally built, measure the actual quantity of fuel in your tanks. Many fuel gauges in older GA aircraft are very simple and have just four components. Buried in each main fuel tank will be a float attached to a metal arm. That float moves up and down with the fuel level in the airplane because the float stays at the surface of the fuel. The metal arm connects the float to a device that rotates and changes its internal resistance as the float moves up and down. The generic name for that device is a potentiometer, and it's much like the volume control that you'd find on an older radio or an older TV set. So for example, when the tank is full and the float is at the top of the tank, the potentiometer might have a high resistance. And when the tank is empty and the float is at the bottom of the fuel tank, the potentiometer might have a low resistance. The potentiometer is then connected by wires to the fuel gauge, and the fuel gauge is calibrated to give you a rough idea of the position of the potentiometer and hence the approximate amount of fuel in the tank. Now, by contrast, a fuel totalizer does not directly measure the amount of fuel in the tank. Instead, it's essentially a very simple computer that relies on the pilot to tell the totalizer how much fuel is in the tank. For example, if you fill your fuel tanks to the top 
and your tanks hold, say, 40 gallons of usable fuel, then you'd enter 40 gallons into the fuel totalizer. Later, as you fly, a fuel flow transducer very accurately measures the amount of fuel that's being fed to the engine in real time. And as you burn fuel, the fuel totalizer subtracts the amount of fuel that's been burned and displays the total fuel remaining in the tanks. Now, the key to using a fuel totalizer successfully is to make sure that each time you add fuel to the aircraft, that you also enter the correct amount of fuel into the totalizer. If you do, then the fuel totalizer can give you a very accurate indication of the fuel on board. Over 20 years ago, I was in a partnership of a Cessna T210, and the very first thing we did was to add an engine monitor and fuel totalizer to the aircraft. Often you'll find both of those functions in the same device. And we had aftermarket tip tanks on the airplane, so we could carry a total of 120 gallons of fuel. And often when we refueled the airplane, the amount of fuel that we added to fill the tanks would match the amount shown on the totalizer within one or maybe one and a half gallons, which meant that the real-time display on the totalizer of the fuel on board at any moment was probably accurate within one to two gallons. Now, by contrast, the fuel gauges that came with the airplane had just five marks, a mark for empty, one quarter, one half, three quarters, and full. And looking at those gauges, you'd be lucky to read each one within five gallons, meaning that you had a total uncertainty of at least 10 gallons when reading the fuel gauges. So a fuel totalizer can give you a far more accurate indication of your fuel on board, provided you set it correctly each time you add fuel. And just a reminder that I love hearing from you, and I read many of your emails on the show. If you'd like to send me a message, just go out to aviationnewstalk.com, click on contact at the top of the page. That's absolutely the best way to send me a message. And of course, I also want to thank everyone who supports the show in one of the following ways. We love it when you join the club and sign up at aviationnewstalk.com slash support to support the show financially. You can also do that at aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. We also love it when you leave a five-star review on whatever app that you're listening to us on now. And of course, if you're in the market for a headset, please consider buying a Lightspeed headset and using one of the links in our show notes, because if you use those links, they will donate to help support the show. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. And remember that you can always go around. You can always go around. If it don't look right, coming down. Don't wait until your silence may be sliding upside down. 